Um, thank you all for your time. Um, I have the particular pleasure and indeed challenge of taking you on a brisk canter through the image rights ordinance in just 10 minutes. So without further ado, let's um, start looking at it. Um, a very brief recap so we know what we're talking about here. First and foremost, um, we are dealing with intellectual property in a specific category of intellectual property, indeed a new category of intellectual property. Um, one that's recorded on public register, which is an, an essential part of its integrity. And there's the legal definition. It's defined as personality is personal or movable property. It puts it firmly into familiar territory in terms of intellectual property. Unlike trademark, a registered personality is not constrained by class or geographic area, which lends itself to some useful applications we'll look at in a minute. And also, significantly, just because you register your personality in Guernsey does not mean that is where you have to hold the property. There's been a lot of adverse comment in the press that Guernsey is jumping on some sort of tax wheeze. Well, the point is, it's personal property. You can hold it wherever you choose. You can integrate it as part of tax planning if you wish, but there's no presumption that you're doing so. The components of this law, first and foremost, clearly, who owns it? Uh, referred to as the proprietor and the law. Uh, we as registered agents get to know who the proprietor is, but that's not public information. That's not on the register. What is in the register is what the law terms the personage. That's the real person behind the registered personality. Think of David Jones being David Bowie or Stephanie Germanotta as Lady Gaga or indeed as Robin Fenty as, as Rihanna. Underneath that, we come down to the core property right, the registered personality. And from this, having registered this, you then have the ability, optionally, to register specific images. But again, analogous to trademark, you have the option, or at least you have potential protection in respect of both registered and unregistered images. The law is useful for both, and it's up to you what you decide to register as a specific image. So... This is not a privacy law. This is a law based simply on unauthorised economic benefit by others. And therefore, the three principal criteria for, criteria for a test. Is there an economic loss to the proprietor? Secondly, is the image distinctive? In the case of a registered image, you've already crossed that particular burden of proof in order to put it on the register. Um, but the law states here, an image is distinctive if it is associated with a registered personality by a wide or relevant sector of the public. Now, the words or relevant sector of the public are significant because suddenly we can start catering to the needs of minority interest groups, be they train spotters or the Northumbrian Bagpipe Society, and believe me, it exists, I know. We can cater for small groups of people who, outside of those groups, their terminology is unfamiliar to the public at large, but within the group, they have specific and meaningful terms. Um, I should also say that an image is not limited to graphic images. It's essentially a characteristic of the personality. We'll touch on that a little more. Um, and for an infringement to occur, has it occurred in Guernsey, or at the very least, is it viewable in Guernsey? In other words, we come back to the internet again. If you can see it on the internet, you can, uh, you can effectively um, claim a potential infringement. If we look at the Rihanna example, um, I'm not sure who holds her intellectual property, but we'll assume it's simply a holding company of some sort. Robin Fenty would clearly be the personage, as previously described. She is the real person behind the registered personality of Rihanna. And images that I imagine she might wish to protect under her registered personality would include her name, her face, clearly, voice, signature, nicknames, think of Riri, for example, and trademarks. And trademarks, I'll touch on again in a minute, but it is worth considering trademarks as images of the personality also. So, um, looking at the top shop scenario, if we pose those three questions for uh, potential infringement, was there an economic loss? 
clearly there was the t-shirts were being sold without any benefit to Rihanna was her image associated with a registered person clearly it was it was a picture of her no doubt about that at all and was the image viewable in Guernsey yes it was but better still Top shop delivered to Guernsey. I actually had to ask my wife whether we had a top shop in the streets of St Peterport. Turns out we don't, but as evidence that they do deliver by internet to Guernsey. So we've met all three tests there regarding a potential infringement. What might one have done thereafter, having ascertained an infringement? Um, two things: an injunction, essentially the same process as elsewhere, it can usually be obtained if needs be within 24 or 48 hours. The costs of doing so are typical with a lot of other jurisdictions. More importantly, I would suggest, given the nature of what we're dealing with here, always attach a money judgment order for the simple reason that if you do that, there's already a mechanism in place to enforce that in the UK and indeed elsewhere. Guernsey has a list of jurisdictions, including the UK and a few other curious ones, where a Guernsey money order judgment Will be, will be automatically upheld. And of course, if you have um, uh, a judgment upheld by a UK court, and if that is uh, thrown into contempt, you then move into the whole realm of uh, criminal offences and pan-European arrest warrants, potentially. So we've moved from um, a judgment in a minor jurisdiction through some fairly well-recognised, familiar steps, where suddenly you begin to have teeth in the wider jurisdiction. That's really the point I'm making here. Looking further afield, the US, of course, in many states is very well advanced. Rights of publicity, some states more amenable than others. Um, we believe the, the Image Rights Ordinance is going to be well regarded should a judgment be taken there. California, in particular, I think, would be, in some respects, bound to uphold a judgment coming out of Guernsey. Changing subject slightly from Rihanna to uh, a corporate brand protection scenario. This happens to be an example we worked up some months ago. Harley Davidson, an iconic brand which historically has faced some difficulties protecting um, the sort of things it would like to have protected with other IP rights. Um, on the right hand side you'll see here the things we talked about, the proprietor, the personage, the personality would simply be Harley Davidson doesn't have to specify which company and underneath it we would consider these sorts of images trademarks and logo both have been mentioned extensively this morning the point about including a trademark as an image is that trademarks of course are constrained geographically and by class what happens if you witness an infringement in a country under a category that you hadn't bothered to protect for normally that would be the end of the road but if you've registered the trademark as an image of the company, you still have this second bite of the cherry, so to speak. You have this safety net underneath where you can say, <coughs> ignoring for the moment the strict legal trademark argument, that trademark device is an image associated with the registered personality of our company. So our recommendation is always to put your trademarks and logos in there first and foremost. Uh, sorry, are you talking about figurative trademarks here or verbal Literal. trademarks? Literal. Uh, well, yes, it's a good point. One can register phrases um, as well on the thread. You could, you could use a, a, a verbal phrase, if, if that's your question. Yes. Um, key personnel of the company. Think of Richard Branson and Virgin or Steve Jobs and Apple. Sometimes the personnel are icons themselves and very important to the overall brand. Consider <coughs> registering the image of your board members, your other key personnel as assets of the company. Commercial images, um, they may be other departments, I've put here Harley Davidson Motorcycles, Harley Davidson Financial Services and so forth. This bit I like, colloquial terms, which you really can't trademark in the, uh, in the sense here. Fathead, shovelhead, panhead are all terms used by Harley Cognoscenti to describe the variants of the V-twin motorcycle. And I particularly liked snogs, pipe mice, and Susie's knobs. And just in case you're wondering what those were, um, snogs, the silencers, pipe mice, are the baffles fitted in within the silencers, and Susie's knobs, let me assure you, are the switch gear on the handlebars. All of that you could register as an image associated with a brand. 
Um, and of course, Harley famously tried to trademark the sound of their engines throughout the 90s and possibly, I think, into the early 2000s, with great difficulty. I don't think they ever succeeded. Um, we can file sound files, distinct to sound files, as a registered image on the image rights register. So the the potato, potato, tick over sound, as Harley Davidson would be a prime example, a sound file that could be uploaded to the registry and protected. And indeed, any other image really associated with the company, we have here some of the merchandising memorabilia, um, Harley Davidson TV channel, even the New York um, Stock Exchange ticker acronym. These are images associated with your brand that you may care to protect. Anyway, wrapping up. Um, we have a mechanism that protects past, present and future images. Future because it captures unregistered images. Um, it's not tied to a static, very specific device in the way that a trademark registration would be. It captures evolving situations. It's property that you can point to a register to prove what you registered when. And um, incidentally, you can choose optionally to register the existence of a contract if you've licensed out some or all of your image rights. You don't have to reveal the, reveal the terms of the contract, but you can note that the contract exists, all of which helps you should you subsequently be arguing for financial damages should somebody infringe that. They should have known better if the contract was flagged in the first place. The law is um, compliant internationally. It has the usual carve-outs for fair usage and so forth. There's no reason why it shouldn't be upheld in any other compliant jurisdiction. Money judgments, as we've mentioned, are enforceable. And if you choose, you can indeed use the registered Guernsey image rights as part of an overall corporate planning exercise. And it's simple to register. And we end with a smiley cup of coffee for the simple reason that a typical registration, given that registration of personality lasts for 10 years, which instead you can renew as often as you want, costs about the same as a cup of coffee a day. So given the wide potential protection it provides, I would argue, as we do to our football and clients, frankly, you'd be nuts not to. And on that happy note, I shall close. If the chair wishes, I can take questions yeah. now. I'm happy to talk later. As you wish. Any questions, <coughs> just quickly? Um, I actually wondered what the take-up was in terms of, did you, do you know how many have been registered? Yes, there's approximately 55 so far. It's a slow burn. Mm -hmm. I think there was a presumption on those that drafted the law, and I have to say it was 10 years in the drafting. It's been quite a slow product from Guernsey. I think they th thought the take-up would be much quicker, or at least some people did. Um, but the reality is here, we are talking about a tiny offshore jurisdiction, and the big question is always is, what is the acceptability elsewhere? Which is why I've tried to address some of those issues now. Yes, there's a risk, if you like, this is untested. None of this has gone to court yet. But on the other hand, it doesn't cost a lot. It's internationally compliant. All of the feedback we've received in two years from uh, lawyers has been that, on the whole, this seems to be well drafted. And if you view it as being analogous to an insurance policy of some sort, I would suggest you should be considering offering this to your clients, not as a supplement, uh, sorry, a substitute in any way, but as another tool to sit alongside all of the other well-proven IP remedies. This fills a useful niche. It underwrites the contractual arrangements that most image rights are dealt with now just as contractual arrangements between parties. It puts some property rights underneath those. It should be viewed as another um, weapon in the arsenal of weapons, really. Keith, do you have some names of personalities uh, who have registered with your... Probably. Um, it depends what circles you follow. There are some famous DJs, so I'm told, Afrojack, one or two others. Perhaps the highest profile one from the footballing circle would be Manuel Pellegrini, who's the manager, Manuel Pellegrini, yeah, manager of Manchester City. Um, uh, frankly, it's a mixture if you look through, but there are several reasonably high-profile personalities. Uh, I was just going to say, it was heavily marketed in Manchester two years ago, in fact, uh, which probably explains Pellegrini's... Uh, um, I'm told he was led up this path by his accountant, which makes... Um, Good sense. We have found. By, uh, um, you can't have uh, mentioned Guernsey. Which is something <laughs> 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 we have found that very seldom is it the client that 
makes the decision. The gatekeepers are the accountants and the lawyers. Ideally, one needs to get the client, the accountant, and his lawyer in the room at the same time. They all look at each other and finally say, yes, this is worth doing or not, as the case may be. Um, but in Manuel Pellegrini's case, that was based on, I think, overall financial planning. Kifa, I'm going to be very blunt, but what's in it for us as solicitors to actually, you know, refer your services? Well, it's, it's, it's the assumption that this is, um, because these rights can be extended globally, if you were providing they can be viewed in Guernsey, the infringement is likely to take place in France or the US or further afield. We can only go so far with Guernsey advocates, mm -hmm. beyond which we must partner, and indeed we do partner with a number of law firms internationally. We need that network if we're to provide a seamless client, uh, sorry, a, a seamless service to the client, we need to be able to move from Guernsey to the jurisdictions further afield in the knowledge that there is good legal representation who understands this product. And would uh, a judgment from a, a Guernsey court be enforceable um, easily in other jurisdictions, in particular in the European Union? That's yet to be tested, so I can't give you an answer. Um, I can tell you that if you attach monetary damage to it, there are some automatic mechanisms in place. But the law should be viewed sympathetically, particularly in those jurisdictions that have some partial personality rights also. There's nothing about this that contradicts those fledgling rights as they are. This is really one step further. It's bolstered by the fact there is a register to back up the property rights. Mm. You do have a threat section, don't you, in the image rights? Mm. So that's one safeguard, I think. And then we would also be able to apply for anti-suit injunctions to stop enforcement in the Guernsey courts in appropriate circumstances. I imagine so. Here, I must say, I'm not a lawyer, so I leave it to those better qualified than I to talk about precise mechanisms. I think it's mm. actually explosive. I think we've got the best to keep it out of. It's, I'm, sorry if we have to, it's explosive in one way, <laughs> a very interesting way, because it creates an interesting tension between copyright and image right holder yeah. that doesn't exist at the moment. Mm -hmm. For the moment, the pendulum has swung very far in favour of the copyright holder, the photographer, mm -hmm. and it will create an interesting tension between the paparazzi, who won't have got a contract signed for a photo shoot, but will claim copyright over an image, and if on the other side you have the subject of that photograph who has registered image rights, he may be able to prevent certain aspects of use by the paparazzi. Responsible news reporting is fine, you can't prevent that, but commercial exploitation, um, suddenly the subject has something to answer the copyright holder with. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I think we mm. have one. I've, I've oh, got one comment, sorry. Mm. I think actually, um, I, I do know about it, I've known about it for a number of years, and yes, it is very fledgling, however, um, I can imagine if somebody is using an image of a celebrity or something like that, and they do have a registration, if you were to claim an appropriate infringement of those image rights, the other side would have some seriously squeaky bum moments. Because yes. you won't yeah. really know whether or not they are actually damaging <coughs> well, or not. I, and as a result, mm. that is actually going to be quite a useful uh, yes. uh, uh, missile to have in your, in your uh, sort of... Uh, mm. I, I can confirm Arsenal. that in respect. We have one client so far for whom we issued cease and desist letters through the US office, and we had a reasonable rate of takedown. We sent about 30 letters out. We had several takedowns, and I think it was precisely it was the unknown fear factor. And, and also, Not familiar with this, don't know what's involved, but it, it looks away. official. Yes. And also, someone like Pellegrini, I think, is actually it's, it's perfect because he's not really going to be trading in that sense from a trademark perspective, mm. but he still needs to have, somebody will use him to kind of vlog stuff. Yeah. So I, I can see some benefit of it. There are lots of examples I could give you given more time, but it's but particularly good United for States. the opportunist marketing by others of your image. Mm. Mm. And Manchester United are renowned for holding onto the image rights of all their players. That's uh, not a problem, as, as a registered yeah. personality. No, fits in very nicely with their strategy. I have, if anybody wants to see later, I have some examples of registering a football player. As, a, as an individual, you would register your personality, but you can assign, of course, your image whilst wearing a particular club strip to the club you're playing for. So there's no inherent conflict that you can manage these things appropriately. Yeah. You've suggested that the, um, you know, a, an order in Guernsey might be enforceable in the US. Absolutely. Was yes. that because they're sympathetic um, to these types of 
I point you to this paper on our website written by my colleague Angela Adrian, who's she's a US and UK lawyer. And cutting to the chase, I think her view is that in California, um, judgments from overseas territories would be upheld if they were not in conflict there or not overridden by a federal US copyright um, claim, which need not be the case here. So her conclusion was that we felt there was a high probability of this law being favourably received. I mean, mm. I think if, if you really want these services to mm. really take off, this is something that you, you absolutely need to double check with your team, if your team, because you need to see whether judgments can be executed. Yes. Ex 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 I think it's called, in exequatur, so that mm. uh, foreign mm -hmm. courts, courts are actually going to enforce that judgment, mm -hmm. uh, especially where celebrities uh, leave and, 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 and Yes. Like the US and, and, and also, you know, Paris, London. That, that is an essential key to your uh, marketing yes. pitch. Yes, uh, it is. Obtaining those sort of opinions can be expensive, of course. But um, <laughs> oh, well. uh, uh, clearly, what everybody would like to see is a test case, mm -hmm. um, yeah. which is a partial comfort, but of course, every case is different, so you can't ultimately. Rely on that too much. Do you think the scope yeah. for um, some of the images to be challenged in terms of validity? Well, the test, to go back to the test, is is the registered image associated mm -hmm. with a registered personality? And that can be quite tenuous. As well, well, yes, and, and I, can, I can see some cases where the argument will be quite fine mm -hmm. uh, in the eyes of the general public or a relevant group of the public is the image associated with registered personality. That's the key test at law. So there will be debate and argument in the more yeah. ambiguous cases. Mm -hmm. Is there a judge in the world court that's actually done intellectual property at the bar? Um, not to my knowledge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And would they get in uh, silk from England or, or what? Or we just have uh, Chapel King I, I'm not <laughs> qualified sufficiently to answer you that. I don't know. Is there a because it's also a queer patent law, isn't it? That you've got because a patent which is registered anywhere in the world is also automatically registered in Guernsey. It can be. I'm not sure that it is automatically, yeah. but you. Do you never get examination or anything like that? No, it's, it's a secondary one to the UK. Great. I think we ought to wrap up now. Um, thank you so thank much, Keith. Mm. That was great.